as well? Yes, sir. Uh, mm. Jaydeep sir has joined. Uh, so, uh, Natarajan sir will be joining in five minutes. He just told me. Okay. All right. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi, Dr. Hi, Hudson. How are you? Hi, Jaydeep sir. I'm good. I'm good. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, Jaydeep sir has joined. Okay. I'll be. Dr. Pooja from Amrita Institute has also joined. Sir. Okay. I'll give you the uh, link from YouTube as well. Yes, sir. I think I will put here in the chat. Is the link for YouTube? And uh, yesterday I was watching the uh, Retina Society meeting. That was great. You know, everything now comes virtual. Right. And uh, that's the way it's going. But I think it's a good idea. Oh. And uh, oh. have did you guys watch yesterday the uh, Retina Society meeting? It yes, was sir, supposed to be. I, I couldn't join, sir. I was at the hospital yesterday. Ah, okay. I I I was supposed to go to the uh, uh, Retina Society meeting in uh, New York, but uh, oh. it was not possible due to coronavirus, so right. I couldn't join there. Nobody actually, and uh, they cancelled as they canceled so many, so many meetings around the world. And uh, we have the uh, Brazilian Congress of Ophthalmology next April. Uh, I hope it's going to work by that time, but uh, people cannot tell everything for sure as of yet. So we keep hoping for good news and uh, praying for better news and that uh, we're going to be free from this, uh, this situation, no? And, uh, okay, everything is okay. Let's All hope set. so. My next year, we can have meetings. Yeah, maybe we could... We Probably by March, April. Yeah, that's it. It's going to take a while, but uh, we hope that's going to happen. So I'm just sharing the uh, link with uh, somebody else, and uh, we'll just take two more minutes for people to join in, and uh, Natarajan as well. And uh, actually, uh, I was going to tell you today about uh, more advanced techniques in uh, vitro retinal surgery, things that we probably gain in time uh, from experience and time doing the surgery and these things. And uh, I would like to share, because this is interesting that we share and uh, we discuss the cases, we, we talk to each other, and uh, that's, for me, it's of utmost importance that we discuss, and uh, it's good to know whatever you do in your services and uh, whatever we could do to improve. So many, you know, I was listening to, uh, Retina Society yesterday, and uh, still things to be performed that are not uh, performed from, from everybody. You know, uh, for macular hole, for a long standing macular hole, for example, in those macular holes that uh, don't close, you gotta do, uh, you know, autologous ILM or you, uh, RPE graft, and uh, you know, things people some. Uh, somehow do and perform. I already uh, made some uh, 
fancy surgeries, but uh, you never know whether you're going to get 100% uh, sure, oh, this is going to work. And uh, you have the PVR as well, uh, that always come with this potential of uh, creating some problems. But uh, still, we hope uh, these techniques, these new techniques and these things are going to be just uh, right uh, within time. And uh, that's a matter of, uh, of time. So I will share. I was uh, preparing a video yesterday for the Cordoba meeting. The Cordoba meeting is a meeting here in South America. It's going to be total, totally online. So we record the videos, and after we recorded the videos, we send them the videos off to uh, this meeting. And uh, so they're going to be putting these videos online by the time of the event. Uh, and uh, it's going to be, be just, just a cool event. And I'll share with you uh, the links there on for you to, to participate. And uh, they have this meeting on, uh, uh, actually, it's a, a contest. Uh, if you play any sport, like uh, me, I did uh, wrestling. So I could send a video on wrestling because I'm an ophthalmologist. So I'll be taking part in the Olympic Games. <laughs> That's good because... Uh, <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll share with you later. And I uh, was preparing this, and then uh, I was preparing a video for us to it's see. It's the Retina Olympics, is it? What is that? It's the Retina Olympics. Yeah, Retina Olympics, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice. So I, 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 I got a video from, from wrestling that I took part in uh, Mexico, the Pan American uh, tournament uh, years ago, and uh, I, I chose this video. I think it's going to work somehow, you know. But, uh, you know, it's a dream for us to be in the Olympics, and uh, uh, I was athlete in wrestling for so many years, but uh, it was not possible to participate because I had to, to study a lot for ophthalmology, residency, and these things, and... Uh, but I still play somehow. I play, I play judo now, but uh, I'm not into competitions because uh, I got a little older, but I'm still in shape. <laughs> it's good. So That's great. That's um, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you practice any sport, uh, J.D.P.? Well, uh, not anymore. So I used to play hockey when I was in college and in school. Yeah, it is interesting because of uh, weather, maybe in some season. But, yeah, once you go into medicine, then it's very difficult to continue. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah I know. Not that easy. Hello, Dr. So, Axa. Hmm? What is that? Asta here. Hi, Asta. How are you doing? I'm great, sir. How are you? I'm fine. We are fine here. And... Uh, it's good to be with you, and uh, I have to present you uh, their online here, Carlos Alberto, Carlos Henrique, Jessica Fassbender, uh, three of our uh, five Retina Fellows. Uh, Nicole is on vacation. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. And uh, Jessica presented yeah, hi, everyone. last week. And uh, Rodrigo Morato is there too. Yes. And uh, Rodrigo is from the Clinical Retinal Fellowship. And the Professor Natarajan just uh, got in. Hi, how are, how are you, Natarajan? How are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. Hi, Francine, hi. Was, Francine was very happy to participate into that uh, next event. She was calling yes. me, she was oh, excited. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> this is good. Yeah, it's day after tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just sent you the. Uh, uh, invitation in the group. Yeah, I, I saw I saw it. And uh, she was very happy calling me and asking uh, how would you perform this and that. I said, no, Natarajan is the guy. So don't <laughs> worry about it. 
<laughs> so, uh, I was telling the uh, residents and fellows about, uh, you know, uh, after a while, you get to a level that uh, you may do different techniques in uh, vitreo retinal surgery. So that's why I elected today for us to discuss some points into vitreo retinal surgery. And uh, so I will share with you first a video where we have involved the um, giant retinal tear, we have involved uh, PVR, we have uh, retinotomies, retinectomies, we have PFC, we have lasers, and uh, what, how uh, should we go more or less and do more or less retinotomy, this and that. So I will share the video, this is a cool video. And uh, so we discuss the video as well. I, I actually will present this video in Oftalmo Cordoba, Argentina. Some, uh, it's going to be uh, October, I was telling them. And so I will uh, just put it uh, right here. Last time I was uh, trying to share my screen and uh, I was not sharing. <laughs> Could you? Can you see my, my screen now? The, the yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so let me enlarge yes, it. I will enlarge it and... Uh, the, that's the eye bank foundation and uh, the surgery is a posterior retinotomy for giant retinal tear with fixed folds, PVR. And uh, the thing is here, what you do and uh, what if you have this patient with uh, a lens is still there and clear lens and uh, sh should you go ahead and uh, do lensectomy or fake emulsification and uh, intraocular lens for every patient and it is possible to go too far in the periphery without uh, hitting the lens so it is so you have this here this uh, very large uh, retinal tear but you see that the patient, the patient had a trauma in the past. So you see the large retinal, giant retinal tear, but still you see up above, you see PVR, and you see subretinal fluid, you see macula alpha, superior retinal detachment as well. Only a bit, a bit of the retina inferiorly is uh, attached. So cool images, and uh, you see on the right side the fixed folds. So how could, could you prop possibly flatten these, uh, these fixed folds, and uh, it's not possible. So I started with a very peripheral relaxing uh, retinotomy. By this point here, and uh, I will point out for you, uh, some would probably start working on the uh, fixed folds uh, itself. I tried doing that, but uh, it wouldn't open anyways. So that's why in this case, in this specific case, I had to go and uh, do the uh, uh, relaxing retinotomy. And now I am uh, unfolding, uh, actually folding the retina to work in the posterior subretinal space. And uh, in this way, I get rid of RPE cells and in, in, uh, trying to avoid uh, proliferative vitreal retinopathy. So after doing the core vitrectomy, I did the relaxing, the relaxing retinotomy severely, and now I'm working in the uh, uh, posterior retina there, subretinal space. So Natarajan, I, I, I want to point out this detail here. Uh, oh. You see the edges of the retina, of the giant retinal tear, they are folded. You see? Yeah. You have cystic changes, you have the folded retina at the very periphery, as you see here, you, s you see the retina is uh, folded. Can you see my arrow? Yes. Yes. So you see the retina is folded here. You have cystic changes. And uh, so how could you get rid of these, these things? And uh, uh, unless uh, you could uh, probably continue the retinotomy with the opening of the large retinal tear, which is already there. 
So how, uh, Jadip, would you do the same? Or would you do different? Would you go uh, straight on the retinal uh, star and uh, try opening the retinal star? No, I, yeah, I, I would first, yeah, I'll first try to uh, open the star by uh, probably taking a, a pick or some uh, uh, instrument so that I can lift the membrane at the center of the star and they use a forcep to remove those membranes and try to flatten the stars. That's what I will try first. I mean, at yeah. least to some extent. I will try to release the... Uh, if I can't feel the entire membrane, I will at least try to release the traction which is at the center of the fold. And then, I'll, if not possible, it's not coming out, then I might leave it and then try to flatten the retina with the uh, PFCL and check if it is flattening, all right. If not, then, uh, yeah, then the last reserve would be... a. Uh, Relaxing right next to me. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I re I tried doing that beforehand. You know, before carrying on with the retinotomy, I approached the star, and uh, right. the only traction we had was the vitreous itself. So I removed the vitreous, and uh, I tried getting anything out of the uh, re uh, retinal star over there, the fixed folds, but uh, there was nothing. It was internal. The, so the, the yeah, maybe it was an intrinsic contracture rather than a yes, membrane yes. causing the fold. Intrinsic, that was intrinsic. Right. So, so uh, the yeah. attractions were from uh, inside the retina, in Correct. just pulling it and the shortening it. This was interesting. So I continue here with the posterior subretinal vitrectomy, and uh, guess what I'm going to do there? And uh, you see a small, uh, tiny. Uh, Bleeding Bleed. vessel over there? Yeah, yeah. It's my small, tiny blood vessel there, uh, uh, you know, just uh, bled uh, due to our approach here. But it was so so small that it didn't uh, 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 cause any problem to the surgery, any uh, no hazy media. And so this point, it, it, this is very interesting because uh, this is a unique surgery. You don't do that for all patients. But... Uh, we had to fold the retina over, and here I'm creating a retinotomy uh, from the posterior side. So I folded the retina, and the, I did where the star was, where the uh, attraction was, the uh, posterior retinotomy at that place. You see, uh, Natarajan, this is interesting. I did that yeah. to relieve that space, to relieve that area from the traction that was caused in the uh, 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 retinal detachment and the uh, giant retinal tear itself. So there, see, I'm opening a hole. Yes. Exactly, I'm uh, removing uh, the fixed folds at the core of the fixed folds posteriorly. And so w what did I do afterwards? I unfolded the retina to the uh, anatomic position. And uh, you see uh, there was a star, there was traction, but still I had to separate the retina, the healthy retina from the right side, from the uh, unhealthy retina from the left side. So what did I do? I, I couldn't only put PFC there because if I inserted Perfluor carbon liquid there, and then this perfluor carbon liquid would go, would go uh, subretinal, and so the retina wouldn't attach. So I did this uh, radio retinotomy from posterior towards anterior, as you see. In this way, I separated uh, the retina and I isolated the retina star in the middle. And uh, at this point, what's going to happen? I will uh, insert the fluorocarbon liquid. And you see how the retina flattens. And then if you look eye up above, you are going to see a triangle there. And uh, you see the triangle on the right, and you see the uh, retinotomy, the round retinotomy on the left. You know, uh, it didn't uh, uh, hit the vessel over there, otherwise could uh, probably cause some uh, bleeding. And interesting here, now that I have the retina flat, and of course I cannot flatten everything because you see in between the uh, 
radio retinotomy that I did to separate the fixed fold and the hole over here at the core of the fixed fold. And you see the choroid over here, choroid over here, and you see the retina flatten, but you see this uh, kind of stalk at this area. But if I had to remove everything over here, I could probably increase the likelihood of having the PVR. So that's why I, I did uh, I limited to this re area, and uh, I did end laser around the areas that the retina, where the retina was flattened. As you see here, the round retinotomy. Now I'm going to go towards the uh, radio retinotomy. Actually, the radio retinotomy separated this uh, healthy on the right side, the healthy retina from the uh, uh, damaged retina on the left. So I did two rows. Are you yeah. doing continuous mode laser or? Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, he's doing a laser painting. Right? Yeah. Like continuous mode. It's, continuous no, mode. it's almost continuous, but I, I, my settings uh, in the constellation are 500, 200, and 100, meaning 500 uh, is the power, uh, uh, two or th 200 or 300 is the duration and uh, 100 is interval, so it's very fast, but it's not continuous. That's why oh, you see okay. the, uh, the points over there, but I, I try to do a line, you know, a line. It's like drawing a line around the yeah. area, so it, 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 that's going to give you the nice uh, healing, nice scar, like a line, a black line in the future after the laser it resolves, and you see uh, the uh, the areas that I did laser around are flattened. You see, they are flattened, and uh, you don't see uh, even though even this area here, th this fold, you know, the laser took it. So the retina superiorly is attached. So uh, Natarajan, what do you think about it? I you think uh, you know you managed it very well because th this is like a. I also have some patients like this where you do a you do the ret uh, retinotomy uh, on, a, on a really tailor made, not as a just cut everything uh, in the uh, peripheral part. I think it's a really preserving some area of retina and also exposing less of RP, which is good. Yeah, I, I try first to go and uh, as we do for all patients, we remove the vitreous and then we. We try try to get rid of any tractions, but uh, sometimes, you know, this was a traumatic uh, a giant retinal tear, and the patient took too long to show up, and uh, they want to have the, uh, the, the operation, but uh, you 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 may not get the operation for the right time. So that's why we have to 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 be more invasive. You know, so going back to that uh, part of the surgery, so we did uh, uh, the uh, posterior retinotomy over there, and we unfolded the retina. After unfolding the retina, you see uh, I'll, I'll do the uh, radio retinotomy. So the radio retinotomy is going to separate the uh, healthy retina on the right from the uh, the star-like. Areas in the as, as soon as you do retinotomy, peripheral retinotomy, the retina is shortened, so it gets back to the uh, the position uh, it, it should be without causing traction. So with the PFO, you could flatten all areas, but now you have to hold the areas uh, the retina is still. So the laser was the next step, and uh, after this step, I will forward a little bit. And uh, we we have the uh, the next step here. Whatever we did was uh, we decided to do more laser, uh, 360 degrees. Sometimes I like doing laser, but only one line, wherever the retina is not detached, so that in this way you avoid any tractions from the. Uh, uh, lizard in the area, so avoiding the, the traction from uh, one side to the other side. 
and uh, we use the wide angle so I'm doing here the more laser around and just uh, to hold it uh, firm and the good decisions now was to do a, a direct exchange. You see the silicon oil coming in, and this direct exchange. What uh, kind of I silicon oil, teacher? I, I like doing that. What is that? What kind of silicon oil? Five hundred? Yeah, th yeah. This is one thousand. One thousand. Thanks for asking. This is one thousand silicon oil, and uh, I like. You see, the lens is pretty clear. You don't have any lens touch. And uh, Natarajan, we are going to be talking on the trauma course from uh, Hugo Ocampo. And uh, my theme was chosen to talk about, uh, you know, avoiding touching the lens and that being very careful with the lens when you don't need to remove it. Because, you know, you have lots of things to do in this case. And uh, you could uh, actually, if you are trying to do very peripheral retinotomies, you could well uh, remove the lens as well. But... Uh, then that could probably and possibly uh, increase the uh, possibility of PVR. And so that's, what, that's why I, I prefer not to remove the lens unless it's uh, necessary. And uh, you, uh, by any uh, ways, you go to peripheral and then you had to uh, re remove the lens because you've touched the lens. And uh, what I'm going to tell in that uh, event, in the future event, is that... Uh, uh, it's possible to spare the lens without touching it, unless you need it. And uh, you see, it, that's a great an example. We go uh, very peripheral and uh, the lens is there, pretty clear. And uh, the reason I want to discuss this with you now, and uh, uh, I would like the opinion from uh, Jadeep, and uh, Professor, Professor Natarajan as well. I like doing, we have, you know, we have uh, uh, to our Can service, we have the Constellation and the Stellaris. They both have uh, automated injections, but I rarely use the automatic injections because oftentimes when I press on the pedal, I got too many bubbles around and the, you know, the silicone coming in, even though you go uh, slow, sometimes you get these bubbles around. So I do this manual. So I have uh, the silicone oil on the side in uh, a special cast like that. And uh, you, you rotate the uh, device and then the silicone goes very very slow inside the eye and at the same time you remove the perfluorocarbon liquid uh, and uh, Carlos both Carlos and uh, Jessica they know Rodrigo as well uh, he's been following me uh, for uh, some time uh, even though he's a clinical fellow but uh, sometimes he shows up in the OR and uh, I insist that I has to go to the OR as well and so you, you know that I do that way and so by doing that you see uh, I use a wide-angle lens, you see the silicone oil coming inside. You see everything all flat there, so I did not have uh, the retina raised. And so I put the uh, uh, backflush cannula after I, I removed the silicone oil. This is the thing. I started removing the, uh, I mean, the perfluorocarbon liquid from the holes area so i don't have here any more uh perfluorocarbon liquid so the perfluorocarbon liquid is only here in the middle so there is no way perfluorocarbon liquid you go uh, under the retina what, what do you think about it uh professor Natarajan? yes i think i agree i keep the pfcl up to the brim of the actual tab and i actually use the viscous fluid injector and then do a PFCL oil direct exchange, which is always good because you won't get any uh, slippage of retina. So rarely I do a PFCL air exchange and air oil exchange. If, if yes. I, have... I, I like doing that because uh, if you go straight here and uh, start everything from the middle, the PFC uh, comes and that keeps going and could go inside the uh, the main retinotomies. As you see here, it already passed 80%, 90%, and I see everything is flat. You see here, I, 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 I guess you can see the line here of the perfluorocarbon carbon leak. Yes, yes. So it's coming over here, just at the edges of the holes. That's yes. the uh, pathway. 
So if I start here and the, the PFC is out there, so it could well come inside. So since I started here and I see nothing's coming inside, it's coming uh, into my uh, backflush candle as a single bubble and it's coming and flowing well and the retina is flattened. So now I move my drainage, my passive backflush drainage here uh, to, uh, with the uh, backflush candle, I move it to the center. So uh, why do you think about that, uh, uh, Jadeep? Uh, well, sir, you, you're saying that you start uh, uh, PFCL oil exchange from the peripheral uh, part of the PFCL bubble. You yeah. put your uh, aspiration, uh, the needle there, and then you aspirate till it reaches the edge of the brakes. Yes. And yes. then once it's past the edge of the brakes, then you bring it to the center. Yeah, that's the idea. Remember, Carlos, right. we do that? Yeah, uh, so I think yeah, that's, that's a good idea because, uh, as you said, some PFCL can go under the retina. So what I do is I remove uh, the fluid uh, anteriorly first and let the oil reach the pupillary plane. And then I go between the oil, which is superior, and the PFCL down. In between, there is a meniscus of fluid. So that, that is in the periphery. So I remove that. And as, I, as you said, I come to the edge of the retinectomy or retinotomy. And once exactly. I reach yeah. there, I aspirate the fluid. Sometimes there is some fluid under the retina. So I keep the flute needle at the edge of the retinotomy or the break and let the fluid and from under the retina get out. And then I come to the center. Great idea. And I'll tell you, you pointed out a very good question. And, uh, because I'll otherwise that fluid can sleep under the retina later. Yeah, yeah. This is very good. But you have to think, this case the patient is fakic. So right. think about right. it. You know, I like when I, when I insert a uh, perforocarbon liquid right before doing the direct exchange, that I call this direct exchange. So I exchange PFO for silicone oil. When I insert the uh, perforocarbon liquid, the perforocarbon liquid should go up to the aura serrata. Because if it goes that high, you won't have much uh, fluid BSS. So mm -hmm. that's a good idea to do because if you have too much of BSS and you have to go too peripheral to remove it, you might touch the lens. Touch that's the, the lens. point. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, uh, so I agree guys, with you. Yes. I agree with you and I do exactly the same. But due to, because this, especially this one, I do for all, but especially this, uh, case where you have these, uh, fake uh, patients, uh, you know, fake patient. I go and I put, I insert a uh, perforocarbon liquid up to the oral serrata and then maybe a little more, not much, maybe a little more. And then I start injecting the silicone oil. So by the time the silicone oil is coming in, I go to, uh, with the cannula, I go as peripheral as I can without touching the lens. And how can I not touch the lens if I have to go too you, peripheral? You can, you can go on the same side uh, as your aspiration needle. Uh, don't cross the lens. Go to the same uh, uh, side. Suppose you're in the right hand, you have the aspiration needle. You go towards the right side periphery. Yeah, Rather than yeah, going across. This is, yeah, yeah, this is a good idea. So you start, but what if the hole, like in this case, is on the other side? Other side. So, so maybe you, have to you cross. can change your hands. You have to cross or use the left hand or something. Yeah, Yeah, good ideas, good ideas. But in this case, I will tell you, I did not change. I did not switch, uh, you know, my hands. And I just uh, right. uh, did it with the same hand. But how? And this is a subject from the class from the lecture I will be giving on the how to uh, so, spare the lens. So it, you you how, said how that you, you in fakey guys, you need to put PFCL uh, right up to the, uh, as much as possible, as you said, fill the globe with yes, PFCL yeah. as much as possible so that there is very less BSS inside. Yeah, this is the first idea, the first idea, so that you don't have too much uh, BSS or fluid left. 
uh, in between right. the silicon oil and the perfluorocarbonyl. But, but then I, I'm going to tell you now how can I approach and I go straight to this uh, BSS in between the two, the two things, you know, silicon oil and the perfluorocarbonyl without hitting the lens. So if I'm going and uh, uh, our fellows uh, know that and uh, we teach them how you rotate the eye during the surgery. If I do the surgery like that and the eye is, uh, you know, just stuck without any movement, of course, if you cross, you're going to hit the lens right away. So if you are uh, temporal of your nasal, if you, uh, you want to go temporal, you have to put the eye in the other position in the nasal. You have to move and rotate the eye nasal. If I want to go temporal, imagine this. I want to go, in this case, uh, I, I want to go nasal superior. So I rotate the eye temporal inferior. By doing that movement, the uh, backflash can pass below the lens without touching it. If I do that way, it will touch. But if I rotate the eye like that, and I have uh, my supranasal part over there that I want to uh, drain, and uh, my backflash can you go past it without touching the lens. This is a, a matter of moving, moving the eye. It's not easy to do that, but uh, uh, we train that, that a lot. And uh, actually, uh, these ideas, of course, at the beginning, you have to uh, switch the hands and things. And uh, uh, if you want to have the eye uh, stuck, stop it there without moving. But if you move the eye, you can actually do that without touching the lens. And uh, very great ideas, uh, as you said, in this way, switching the hands and uh, going periphery, you don't have too much BSS there because you already put too much, you know, not, not the right amount of uh, peripheral carbon liquid. But if you don't want to touch the lens, that's the way to go. And uh, yes, at the sir. end of the case, the, everything is clear. So have you heard about it, yes, sir. this uh, technique? Yes, sir. I, I, I use this. I use this technique only. I rotate the globe, uh, as you described, in the direction in which I want to uh, walk. So if I want to walk in in nasal quadrant, uh, I will rotate the eye in that direction and so that uh, that minimizes the chance of hitting the lens. So the angle created by rotating the globe will, uh, you know, the instrument will, shaft will pass by the equator of the lens and not by at the pole, posterior pole. So the chance of hitting the lens is minimized. Of course, yeah, it requires yeah, practice. Yeah. And, uh, and another, you need to move thing. the microscope also along with it. The microscope XY also has to be moved so that uh, you are in focus. So that yes, movement yes, of the globe and the focus. microscope has to be together. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. you have to be always in, in focus. And another thing, depending on the lens you use, if, if you have a very wide angle lens, like the SSV from Vogue that has the, those, uh, the, those, those, those foots, foot plates. And, uh, the, you know, you actually can see so peripheral, you, you become happy. Also, this lens is so good because you, I see so peripheral. If you go too peripheral, you touch the lens. So I'm very... Uh, <laughs> Having a very time. wide angle view is very risky in a fake guy, actually. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you can see up to the aura and you feel you can reach there because you can see it. And that is when you go across the lens and hit the lens. So you need to be careful. Even if you can see the aura, try not to get tempted to reach there in fake guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, I want to ask, uh, we have a friend here from Argentina, Augustin. Augustin is a fellow uh, in Argentina, in, in Cordoba from Dr. Tiziano. Augustine, good, good morning. And, uh, Hello. Augustine, Hi, Augustine. And uh, Augustine was helping me yesterday to record the video for, you know, the event in Argentina. And uh, if Augustine, I don't know whether he's listening or his mic is off, but uh, he, he's a retinal fellow. Is, if he would like to comment on that. Uh, are, are you uh, listening, Augustine? I'm very happy that uh, he accepted our invitation to participate. And uh, uh, Rodrigo, do you want to comment on that? 
Rodrigo Morato. Hi, doctor. Hmm. No, uh, very well explained. Thank you. And uh, Jessica, are, are you around? And uh, yeah, this uh, we are used to, to do this uh, step. So I'll go go on with the surgery. It's almost uh, we are almost done here. So doing the uh, direct exchange, you see, you see, you get uh, the PFC up to the end. You don't leave any 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 PFC droplets. The lens gets uh, clear all time, and uh, as you. As you see here, the, uh, yes. the passive way, it's the best way to remove the uh, before carbon liquid. I don't aspirate actively. I think you do the same. I like doing the uh, direct exchange because in this way, you, uh, the media does not get hazy. You see the whole thing up to the end of the surgery. So you remove uh, the last droplet. See there? Last droplet we remove, the retina is attached. And uh, the thing is, uh, how many of you perform air, air fluid exchange before doing all this? Because actually, in this case, you see the retinal detachment, the PVR, the uh, superior and the all problems. So I wouldn't dare doing, uh, you know, the air fluid exchange, even though I could m uh, do the air fluid exchange very slow to keep the retina attached, but uh, my experience is that uh, when you do the effort exchange in those cases where you have some tractions, uh, you actually uh, have the retina uh, more mobile and then dislodge your retinotomies over there to the wrong place, and, and uh, sometimes you rotate the retina, so I don't go uh, to air food exchange before. In those cases, I go, I, I like doing uh, direct exchange. Uh, what about uh, you, Aishwara? Did you did you like it? And uh, do you have any idea of uh, what would you do uh, when you do more vitrectomies? Would you like doing this uh, direct exchange, or would you like to go uh, past the air first and then do the silicone oil? Or maybe J Dip. Asta, Asta, uh, yes, Asta is Dr. there. Hudson. Yeah. Dr. Asta can say maybe. Yeah, Dr. Asta. Yeah, uh, no, I think uh, in such giant retinal tears, I think it's always better to do the direct PFC oil exchange because uh, there's a high chance of slippage with even if we do a very slow exchange, uh, yeah. the slippage is always a problem. So it's always better, I think, especially in cases of in a small tear in a HST, I usually perform my air fluid and uh, uh, followed by uh, uh, oil, but in such GRTs, uh, direct exchange is what I prefer. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think it's better. Uh, I do that, you know, since since I started vitrectomy, and uh, I saw that it works better. And uh, what if you, if you, even though you you do that, what you have this uh, retina rotation? And uh, it's very interesting. We have s too many things to go on and perform surgeries. But uh, if you have some folding or some rotation, rotation of the retina, I like using the tip of the endo laser, which is round at the very uh, uh, periphery, in the very tip. And uh, actually, I use that to unfold those uh, retina folds that could come after the exchange. If you see up above the retina folded, you go with the uh, uh, tip of the endo laser and uh, flatten the retina under silicone oil, and it works pretty well. And another thing that at the end of the case, I tell all patients uh, and uh, explain and I show them, you have to do face positioning and face down. Otherwise, if you don't do that, in this case, probably, uh, would work anyways because the uh, 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 retinotomy, retinotomies and the PVRs and things, we worked and uh, we did everything was superior. So if the patient was uh, staying uh, with their heads up, 
maybe they will know the silicone will go there and uh, tamponade the holes and breaks anyways. But uh, I stress them and emphasize them that you have to keep your face down all the time. Uh, otherwise, uh, the retina could not be attached. And for these cases that I, I do too much with the uh, retina uh, periphery and uh, we do, you know, retinotomies and uh, I offer the patient in the postoperative period. I usually give them uh, uh, corticoids so that uh, we decrease the possibility of PVR. You know, there is not a hard and fast rule for PVRs, but uh, uh, we, we do the, that for our patients and uh, uh, we still have some uh, in those cases and uh, the, the PVR that could happen, but we still we have to work trying to, to do the best for, for the patient. And uh, if you do less surgery, that could work. <coughs> but if you do more surgery, that could work more. So depending on the case, you cannot, you, you cannot go in between. You have to do more or less, but you have to do what is necessary for the patient. And it is an interesting case. I have uh, another case, but uh, it could possibly take too, too long if we, we go uh, showing the uh, next, uh, next Dr. Case. Hudson, uh, I just wanted to ask one question. You don't uh, do any uh, uh, cautery to the edges of the retinotomy or before you do a retinectomy, you don't uh, do any cauterization to prevent hemorrhage? Yeah, yeah, I do that. In this case, I was showing at the beginning of the case, we have had this tiny hemorrhage, but you know the vessel was uh, almost uh, sclerosed, closed, so it didn't cause any problem. But uh, sometimes, if you have some bleeding during the surgery, I like to in uh, increase the uh, bottle's uh, height. I put the pressure up to maybe 50 uh, by the time you are doing retinotomy. And uh, then I go back to 35, 30, and uh, I have the cautery, especially for diabetic patients I use. And I, I still start the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, retinal detachment patient. I start with uh, the cautery in the hand. So anytime you have the uh, hemorrhages, and uh, I use it, but... Uh, Sometimes the perfluorocarbon liquid that presses the vessels and uh, could halt the uh, bleeding as well. So in this case, for retinotomy, I did not use it because it was not necessary. Everything was uh, quite uh, whitish over there. So uh, we didn't uh, need to, to do the cautery and uh, work too well. But if you have more bleedings, of course, and if you have... The, the secret, I will tell you, I, I do that first, uh, always, and I learned from my professor, Marco Zavila, here in my first retinal fellowship here in Goiânia, Brazil, that if you go very peripheral to do the retinotomy, you don't uh, get any vessels. So you could do a perfect retinotomy and dry retinotomy without any bleeding. But if you go a little posterior, and you get the end of the vessels, then you get some bleeding. So then uh, if you want to go there to do more retinotomy, because if you are doing just a peripheral retinotomy to re relieve the retina, that's okay. But if you are going towards the vessel, then it's better off uh, using the cautery. And then I, I, I agree with you. You always use the cautery, uh, uh, Dr. Yeah, Raja? You, uh, Dr. Natarajan, you always use the, the cautery for your uh, patients uh, when you 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 doing retinotomies? No, but I think if it is going to go through a blood vessel, then I do it. Uh, or I use it. Dietary itself. I remember uh, when we were working with uh, John Witch in 93, they were even trying to get a, something like a microwave without touching to do a, a retinectomy. But anyhow, Dr. Jovanovich was not interested in making a new instrument. He said, one more toy, my nurse doesn't like it. So he, so that, that term was used. 
I have actually I put a, a reference in the notes. You can probably share that screen, Hudson. I actually developed a curved vitreous cutter for a fake uh, vitrectomy for doing a oh, basic yeah. incision or even a retinectomy. So that I published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology at the time. Yeah, you, that's that's you very good. That. Yeah, I think that case was was cool, it was an interesting case. And uh, this, Dr. Uh, Datara, uh, what what are your experience about the silicone belt around the road before it start the vitrectomy for this case? The uh, the experience of what? A silicone belt, fascia silicone, como é que fala Ah, this silicone band. The, uh, ah, okay, okay. For this case, so uh, Natarajan, uh, Carlos yes. is asking, uh, what's our experience? And uh, you know, we discussed that. I, I actually we, we saw the discussions yesterday from the Retina Society whether you should go buccal vitrectomy or only vitrectomy. He's talking about uh, Carlos. Carlos Camera is talking about the uh, putting the band around the eye, the 240 band. Yes. That but would but make a, any difference? If, yeah, if it is a giant tear, usually I don't use the uh, belt buckle. But if it's only a PBR with a uh, peripheral breaks or one or two breaks, then I actually like to put a band. Actually, when I do a vitrectomy, I tighten more so that I can do a basic session. I don't like to do lensectomy in there as a primary procedure or even a fake over the IOL. So whenever the patient is even 50, 50 plus with a clear lens, I like to preserve the lens. And I probably like to, if the cataract comes post vitrectomy, I would like to do a fake IOL with an oil removal. So that you've got a good visual rehabilitation. But uh, in case, uh, I mean, that's where I think I made uh, this a curved cutter. And bell buckle, is, uh, I call it bell buckle where uh, or you put a 240 encircling band, and which will help to bring the periphery uh, in view using the wide angle. And you can go exchanging the uh, retractor from the upper nasal and upper temporal so that you don't go exactly uh, diagonally opposite so that you don't touch the lens. Because otherwise, by enthusiastically going to the periphery, you will touch the lens. So you have to be aware of uh, that the eye is like this. And then you, when you're going to do the vitrectomy, uh, uh, putting the light drive from, don't go to the opposite end. You do only the basic session on that part. And then again, exchange the uh, hand. So you can even remove the intuition line, put it on the upper temporal and go through the lower temporal and sitting in the same posture or even uh, turning the table. The idea is to preserve the lens. Sometimes people may wonder you, why not you do a FACO. And uh, so I think natural lens is definitely uh, something which you, you, whatever you do with the eye well, I think the patient can lose the accommodation. So I think in case you can preserve the lens, and if the post vitrectomy, the lens becomes cataractous, and obviously we can do a thick eye well and oil removal or even re injecting oil if you want to change from 1000 to 5000 because of the recurrent PBR. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, for the band, my comment would be, uh, in this case, that we had to do too much uh, retinotomy at the periphery, so the band wouldn't work much. But sometimes, in some cases, I like the band, so I created support. This You have the retina here, and you have the band. It, it makes like uh, 90 degrees, almost 90 degrees. It's like a wall, so you don't have the uh, retina, uh, the free retina hanging there. And so if you have a band or while pressing and uh, doing some, uh, 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 some, some barrier, that would be better that you, if you have uh, not. This case could probably uh, apply for, uh, you know, for this uh, 240 band or any other band, but because he, was, he had too much uh, PVR and the giant retina tear, like the retina was already detached, so I decided not to do, and that wouldn't be uh, wrong to do the band. And uh, good questions, uh, Carlos. Very good questions. Thank you. 
So anybody else would like to comment on the, these cases, these uh, different approaches? You know, it uh, takes a while. Dr. Hudson, this posterior yeah. retinotomy which you did, uh, you, what point you decided to do it at the center of the fold, star fold? So I, I decided to, to do the posterior retinotomy in this case. Uh, I don't do that uh, often, but in this case, we had, this, we had two things that made my decision taken. We had the, uh, the, the star, the uh, retina fold, and also the retina shortening. And so I tried to peel off any epiretinal tissue from the, uh, the star and the retina fold. It didn't come anything. So, uh, and I saw the retina was uh, anterior. It was uh, shortened, actually, very, very shortened. By the time I did retinotomy, you see the retina came from peripheral to uh, mid periphery. That meaning that it was traction in over there. It, it had too, m too much traction. And so uh, I saw still by looking at the retina that you had this star, you had this uh, PVR, local PVR star and the retina fold, and there were cystic changes all over the retina at that area. Uh, so because maybe the uh, giant retina there was hanging there for quite a while, and so started to fold itself, as you saw the edges were folded, and also the retina became whitish and uh, we had intrinsic cystic changes. And so I folded the retina and I decided to open that area. So when I unfolded the retina, so it was attaching easy. And uh, of course, uh, if uh, some areas were not attached, we could probably have uh, made more retinotomy. But I didn't want to uh, uh, perform too much retinotomy. And so that's why I decided to do uh, that local uh, removal of the star-like uh, PVR and the fixed fold. Uh, right, sir. No, why I, what I asked is, uh, why did you have the posterior approach any particular reason for going from posterior approach? Ah, why the why? Because I think it was easier to go because I was already doing subretinal work, subretinal, uh, subretinal uh, vitrectomy. In when I folded the retina and I went posteriorly, the retina would come, but not much. You see, the retina is folded. You do the retinotomy over there, <coughs> the retina doesn't come as a whole. If the retina comes towards your uh, curve, and then it has limitations of movement. When you have the anatomic and normal position and do retinotomy over there, everything could come up. The retina okay. and uh, okay. the, the healthy retina as well. So that's why, it's just a okay. matter of, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, different approaches. And uh, another thing is that uh, anterior, uh, in the normal, uh, if you are facing the retina and you see vessels over there and you approach the retina from the normal side, from uh, internal, from uh, ILM, ILM area towards the RPE, I'm saying uh, the normal way. If you have vessels there, you, you, f you have the vessels actually there. And then you have to cauterize, use the cautery before doing the retinotomy, otherwise you have uh, some bleeding. But then if when you fold, you go from the RPE side, not of, uh, RPE side, I'm telling not uh, there's no RPE there, but uh, RPE side, the, uh, the other uh, part of the retina when it's folded. And if you do the retinotomy and uh, you don't start getting the vessels from the superficial vessels, so you don't have bleeding. But in any of the cases, you might have to use the cautery as you pointed out at the beginning. So it's a matter of option. And I think the retina moves more if you go the, uh, the normal way. But if, when you fold the retina and you do the retinotomy from posterior, you don't have much movement. So the retina is already folded. You, you just uh, move that folded area. But if you have uh, the whole retina coming towards you, that's, uh, you know, that uh, could be a danger. 
Right. And how do you how did you choose the site of this uh, radial retinot retinotomy? Yeah. Uh, you like using radial retinotomy? No, no, uh, like how did you choose the place where you would do the ah, radial okay. retinotomy yes, in I, this case? Yeah, I was what showing... What made you decide uh, that? Or how should okay, we decide okay. for radial okay. retinotomy? Yeah. As I was uh, showing in the video, we have the star, we have the, the PVR here, we had the healthy retina over here, and in between we had this, uh, this fold. I wanted to separate the, uh, the, uh, the star like the retina uh, fold to the side, and then I, I would like to preserve the healthy retina on the other side. So I, by doing the radio retinotomy in between, I separated the two like this. So okay. there, there was no traction from this area to this area because there was a uh, choroid in between. So that's why I decided. Because when I saw this uh, very large uh, retina fold there, I saw, no, this cannot be here. Uh, but this is still is causing traction in the healthy retina uh, immediately uh, besides it. So if I do a radio retinotomy in between, I will separate them both. So these won't cause traction on these. And uh, so that's what, uh, why it worked. And you see in, in the middle there was still some uh, retina fold over there, but I could do laser yeah. one side and right. the other side, and then it stayed flat. The main thing here was to uh, decrease the uh, likelihood of uh, traction. So that's why I decided to do the radio retinotomy as well to decrease the traction right, right. so the retina would sit flattened there and uh, the laser would be uh, taken you know, after PFC and the laser would, would be taken and uh, still to keep things tight over there I put PFC up to the other serrata and uh, did the exchange, as you said, uh, removing BSS, and then things, the, you know, the uh, silicone oil was there, so everything was flattened. That was the reason, I think, uh, more maneuvers sometimes are unnecessary, otherwise you have a redetachment pretty, pretty soon. All right, right. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody wants to comment? Uh, anything else, uh, Natarajan? This is was a very important, very, very interesting case we discussed. It. Very interesting case. Yeah. And, uh, the, the highlights is uh, try to maintain the crystalline lens clear and uh, do what is required in the right place at the right time. That means how do you do a radio retinotomy and how do you assess the cystic retina and also the curve. Uh, uh, giant hair at the edge and the, how to use the least uh, diatomy also to do a good endolaser so that you have a good correlational uh, reaction enough to hold the retina. I think excellent uh, learnings from today. Thank you, thank you. We always learn with each other and uh, it's very good to share and to yes. discuss. The main thing here is, not Rajan, is that we can share and uh, discuss with uh, each other uh, our experiences yes. and uh, you know we are running and uh, doing more in different techniques and uh, uh, me and you and uh, you have uh, a lot more experience uh, from you know switching techniques from the past to the present as uh, you started with the biome and the others all, all those things and uh, we see that things have changed a lot you know yes. when I finished my uh, uh, retina fellow in, in Canada, in Toronto, they were starting, that was 1998, I was uh, finishing my fellowship over there, they were starting and uh, doing more macular hole ILM pills and, uh, you know, they were very shaky and people were afraid of doing those things and, uh, you know, things are just uh, performed so, so better today, you know, yeah. we didn't have uh, the 20 three, five or seven gauges, we only worked. You remember those surgeries yes. lasted almost three hours. And now yes. we do surgery in one hour, so it's a lot better. <laughs> so things got a lot better, a lot better. We, we have started with this vitreous infusion suction cutter, which is a terrible thing. 
and I also done indirect vitrectomy, holding the indirect and then doing vitrectomy with the right hand. With so indirect? The, yeah. Yeah, that's that's historical. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, uh, videos or papers on that? No, that's what I'm looking at. After doing all this, I'm trying to get it back. But that's from 1984 with my mentor, Dr. Badina. So it, yeah, even the giant tear I used to lie down and we used to rotate the patient and lie down and do the fluid air exchange with the patient in prone position. Under yeah. general, I yeah. think, you know, I was uh, in 1997, I was doing my retinal fellowship in Toronto and I was into the surgery with Dr. Lem, Dr. Lem. And uh, he was telling me there is a guy in India that does the indirect uh, vitrectomy. He's very good, but he does that exchange. I think by the end of the surgery, you did this uh, the, the, the exchange or effluent exchange. I think he mentioned you. You know, years ago, it was yeah. 1997, so you were already uh, doing that. And yes. uh, Dr. Lam, Dr. Lam. Yes, Wei Ching Lam. Uh, professor, yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Okay, yeah. so I, I thank everybody for participating. And uh, this is a great discussion with Dr. Natarajan, the residents and fellows, everybody. Uh, Aishwarya? Aishwarya has not answered today. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you, yes, sir. He was asking you something, but I, oh, have you decided next week what are we doing? Yes, sir. I had spoken with sir this morning. Yes. Uh, sorry, when you asked earlier, my internet connection was not good. But then after that, you had already started talking about something else. So I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, yes, sir. Last, uh, this morning, we talked about the topic. Um, sir was telling that next week we can have a class on diagnostics. So I'll present on OCT angio, sir. Since oh. anyway, I'm going to be reading it. You had asked me to read it also. Oh. So I'll read that up more thoroughly and present on OCT angio. And uh, Dr. Pooja, uh, she had to just leave now. She was there till now. I Dr. Pooja that. will be presenting on FFA. She was asking if she can do that because it's a basic class. Hudson, is it okay? Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, right. I will tell the, uh, the fellows we prepare OCT, yes. the, the regular OCT, and Ashwara would uh, talk on uh, OCTA. And, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. That's great, you know. That's, that's great. You know, OCTA. Did you spend after, okay? Okay, okay, that's fine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No problem. Sure, oh. that'll be nice. Oh. nice. Great to be with you. And uh, I will share, I will share you, YouTube. I will share the uh, recordings uh, from uh, YouTube shortly. Right. Thank you very much. Natara, Thank have you. a great day. Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Our Thank day is still you. starting you, here, but I, I... Thank you, everyone. I, have a nice you know, day. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Obrigado to Bye bye, sir. <laughs> obrigado. How do I say obrigado in uh, your language? Daniel. 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 Okay. <laughs>